Soil. Boiled. <laughs> fried. Plastered. Whiffled. Sozzled. And... Plugged. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Only by the exercise of the most consummate caution and address could he hope to get back to his hotel and reach his bed without causing it open again. Of course, if his walk that night had taken him a few yards further down the street, then the door of Mike's place, he would have seen that there was a very simple explanation of the spectacle which he had just witnessed. A walk so extended would have brought him to the San Francisco Palace of Varieties, an outside which large posters proclaimed the exclusive engagement for two weeks of Murphy's Midgets, bigger and better and than ever! <laughs> 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 he was not aware, and it is not too much to say, that the iron entered into William Mulliner's soul. That his legs should have become temporarily unscrewed at the joints was a phenomenon which he had been able to bear with fortitude. That his head should be feeling as if a good many toad bees had decided to use it as a hive was unpleasant, but not unbearably so. But that his brain should have gone off its casters and be causing him to see visions was the end of all <laughs> things. <laughs> William had always prided himself on the keenness of his mental powers. All through the long voyage on the ship, when Desmond Franklin had related antidotes illustrative of his prowess as a man of action, William Mulliner had always consoled himself by feeling that in the matter of brain, he could give Franklin three bisques and a beating at any time he chose to start. <laughs> now it seemed that he had lost even this advantage over his rival. For Franklin, dull-witted claw that he might be, was not <laughs> such an absolute minus quantity that he could imagine he'd seen a man of two feet eight cutting up hash with his toes. That hideous <laughs> depth of mental decay had been reserved for William Mulliner. Moodily, he made his way back to his hotel, and in a corner of the palm room, he saw Myrtle Banks. He's, does anyone know where Raman Banks <laughs> William had always prided himself on the keenness. <laughs> Moodily he made his way back to his hotel. In a corner at the palm room, he saw Myrtle Banks drop in the cavernous into conversation with Franklin. <laughs> but all desire to give her a call on his side of the head now left him. With his chin sunk on his breast, he entered the elevator and was carried up to his room. Here, as rapidly as his quivering fingers would permit, he undressed and, climbing into the bed as it came round for the second time, lay for a space with a wide open eye. He had been too shaken to switch his light off, and the rays of the lamp shone on the handsome ceiling which undulated above him. He gave himself up to the thought once more. No doubt he felt, thinking it over now, his mother had had some very urgent reason for withholding him from alcoholic drink. She must have known of some family secret, sedulously guarded from his ancient ears, some dark tale of a fatal Mulliner taint. William must never learn of it. She had probably said when they told her the old legend of how every Mulliner for centuries back had died a maniac, <coughs> victim at last to the fatal fluid. <laughs> and tonight, despite her gentle care, he had found out for himself. <laughs> he saw now that this derangement of his eyesight was only the first step in the gradual dissolution which was the Mulliner curse. Soon his sense of hearing would go, then his sense of touch. <laughs> he sat up in bed. It seemed to him that as he gazed at the ceiling, a considerable section of it had parted from the parent body and fallen with a crash to the floor. William Bonner stared dumbly. 
He knew, of course, that it was all an illusion. <laughs> a perfect illusion. If he had not had the special knowledge which he possessed, he would have stated without fear of contradiction that there was a gap six feet wide above him and a mass of dust and plaster on the carpet below. And even as his eyes deceived him, so did his ears. He seemed to be conscious of a babel of screams and shouts. The corridor he could have sworn was full of flying feet. The world appeared to be all bangs and crashes and thuds. A cold fear gripped at William's heart. His sense of hearing was playing through the thing already. His whole being recoiled from making the final experiment, but he forced himself out of bed. He reached a finger toward the nearest heap of plaster and drew it back with a groan. Oh! Yes, it was as he feared. His sense of touch had gone wrong too. <laughs> that heap of plaster, though purely a figment of his disordered brain, had felt solid. So there it was. One little moderately festive evening at Mike's place and the curse of the Molliners had got him. Within an hour of absorbing the first drink of his life, it had deprived him of his sight, his hearing, and his sense of touch. Mm -hmm. Quick service, felt Molinar. As he climbed back into bed, it appeared to him that two of the walls fell out. He shut his eyes and was <laughs> really sleep, which has been called, well, nature, tired nature's sweet restore, wrought him oblivion. His last waking thought was that he met and heard another wall. <laughs> William Molinar was a sound sleeper, and it was many hours before consciousness returned to him. When he awoke, he looked about him in astonishment. The haunting horror of the night had passed, and now, though conscious of a rather severe headache, he knew that he was seeing things as they were. And yet, it seemed odd to think that what he beheld was not the remains of some nightmare, not only was the world slightly yellow and a bit blurred about the edges, but it had changed in its very essentials overnight. Where eight hours before there had been a wall, only an open space appeared, with bright sunlight streaming through it. The ceiling was on the floor, and almost the only thing remaining of what had been an expensive bedroom in a first-class <coughs> hotel was the bed. Very strange, he thought, and very irregular. A voice broke in upon his meditations. Why? Mr. Molliner! William turned, and being like all the Molliners, the soul of modesty, dived abruptly beneath the bedclothes. For the voice was the voice of Myrtle Banks, and she was in his room. Mr. Molliner! William poked his head out cautiously, and then he perceived that the proprieties had not been outraged as he had imagined. <coughs> Miss Banks was not in his room, but in the corridor. The intervening wall had disappeared. <laughs> Shaken but relieved, he sat up in bed, the sheet drawn around his shoulders. You don't mean to say you're still in bed. <laughs> Why is it awfully late? Well, did, did you actually stay up here all through this? Through what? <laughs> the earthquake. What earthquake? The earthquake <laughs> last night. <laughs> oh, earthquake. Well, I seem to remember this ceiling coming down, and I thought to myself, well, I shouldn't imagine that that wasn't an earthquake. And then the walls came in, and I, I thought, I guess I believe it is an earthquake. <laughs> then I went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> With eyes that reminded him partly of twin stars and partly of a snake. <laughs> William gave a curt laugh. Yes. Well, I may not spend me whole life persecuting poor sharks with pocket knives. <laughs> but I find that I keep my head fairly well in a crisis. We Molliners are like that. We don't say much, but we got the right stuff in us. He clutched his head. A sharp spasm had reminded him of how much of the right stuff he had in him. And <laughs> how is your fiancé this bright sunny morning? Asked William nonchalantly. It was torture to refer to the man, but he must show her that a mother knew how to take his chance. Oh, I have no fiancé. But I thought you said that you and Mr. Franklin... Well, I am no longer engaged to Mr. Franklin. 
last night when the earthquake started. I cried to him to help me. He disappeared in the open like something shot out of a gun. He, he called over his shoulder and then he, he said, some other time. And then he disappeared. I never saw a man run so fast. Well, the morning I broke off the engagement. She uttered a scornful laugh. <laughs> Sharks and pocket knives. I don't believe he ever killed a shark in his life. And even if he did, I mean, surely marriage means, means something more than this. What a husband needs is not some purely adventitious gift like this. I mean, a mere parlor trick, you might call it, but a steady disposition, a warm and generous heart. How <laughs> true. She murmured feebly. <laughs> Myrtle, I would be a husband like that. The steady character, the warm and generous disposition, and the loving heart. <laughs> Takes it out again. <laughs> and that is the story of my <laughs> And you will steadily understand, having heard it, how his eldest son, my cousin, J.S.F.E. Mulliner, got his name. John San Francisco Earthquake Mulliner. <laughs>